The Grand Canyon, thought to be one of the best and most spectacular records of geology. Take a walk in time where each step takes us one million years into the past. It seems like each rock has its own story. Learn about the geological secrets of the majestic Grand Canyon and those in our very own backyard. There are studies now that have proven what our grandmothers and great-grandmothers were doing wasn't off base. They weren't crazy. It works. Explore curanderismo with Dr. Cheo Torres and Tonito Gonzalez, who share the benefits of traditional medicine. Sun is, of course, the life giver. In this month's viewer question, how do solar flares impact life on Earth? Dr. Harjit Alawalia explains. Welcome to Connect. Each month, we connect audiences to the great people and inspired thinking found at the University of New Mexico. Connect is next. We're talking about the geology of the Grand Canyon and the Rio Grande Rift, and with me is Dr. Laura Crossy and Dr. Carl Karlstrom, uh, both professors of, at the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of New Mexico. What is it about the Grand Canyon that makes it one of the world's iconic geologic landscapes and a destination for people from all over the world? I think it's the beautiful vistas which grab people. They go oh, to the edge of the canyon, they just gasp, you know, with the, with the beauty of it. But then something else sets in, which is it's beautiful and it's, it's natural. It has immense scale, huge distances, and it has immense time that sort of uh, creeps into your consciousness as you stand there on the rim. In a nutshell, what, what formed the Grand Canyon? And that's a hard thing for people to understand. I mean, the, that little river which looks so small down at the bottom yeah. carved the immense canyon. That's right, it started out uh, with the tools during floods. If you've ever stood by the side of a river in a flood and heard the boulders smash against each other when you have very high energy, the river uses the tools it finds. And essentially it's gravity. You know, the water is flowing downhill in the case of the Colorado River, flowing from the Rockies out to the Gulf and on its way, it's carving through the landscape. We say it's a young canyon carved into very old rocks, and mm. the river has essentially carved most of the Grand Canyon in the last six million years, which is a very short amount of time for geologists, whereas the rocks that are revealed as the river is cut down through go back to about two billion. Explain to me what is the trail of time and how have you tried to articulate the immensity of geologic time to the public in this exhibit? I think that was the biggest challenge and the big idea of the exhibit was to give people a sense of geologic time first and foremost, and then of course use the Grand Canyon geology to help illustrate that. So I tend to think of a million years as an, as an example of uh, like what a heartbeat is to a human life. So a million years is like the heartbeat of Mother Earth. The trail uses a distance analogy for time, like any timeline. And it's on the rim, so you don't have to hike down. And you walk along the rim of the trail looking down, and each step is one million years of time. So then to walk back two billion years, you have to take 2,000 steps. And so we have examples from every different rock formation brought up from the canyon from where they were in place and put on these uh, pedestals with, with, all they have is their age and their name. Wow. So are they evenly spaced along ah. the trail or how do you? <laughs> we, we only have one choice of where to place that rock on the timeline and that would be on its birthday. Oh. So each rock is at its place in the time scale Great. to the best of uh, what we would know from geological analysis of what the age of that rock layer is. And uh, actually that, that's been the basis of a lot of our own research in the Grand Canyon area, has to do with establishing the geochronology of many of the different events and rocks in the canyon history. People wonder, okay, they're walking along and there's the rock that has the 540 million year trilobites and then the next rock and the next rock. And then they'll walk a long ways and see no rocks. So these are periods of time on the timeline when, when there was erosion going on rather than deposition of layers. So the great unconformity is the biggest gap on the trail. You have to walk almost a thousand steps be between one rock and the next in terms of some parts of the canyon where 
a, a 500 and 40 million year old rock was deposited on a 1.7 billion year old rock. And so there's almost, almost a thousand steps, a billion years missing in the rock record. So let me ask you this, in the geologic record along the trail, when did life first appear? That's a really, really good question because we tend to think of life as we see it. Geologists have a term for that, visible life. That's the Phanerozoic time period, visible life. Um, but we now know more about microscopic life. Mm. So if you try to think of where is the oldest evidence of microscopic life in rocks of Grand Canyon, what would you say to that? Well, life was on Earth before any of the rocks of Grand Canyon were formed. So 3.8 billion is, yeah, life, life. as far as we know, on planet Earth is the oldest evidence of microscopic life. Microscopic. Soon after the planet formed, life was present on Earth, um, 3.8 billion. But the first life really that's famous, that's, visit, that's recorded in Grand Canyon are these little one single-celled microfossils, they're called, that were found by uh, Charles Doolittle Walcott in 1896. So those go back 750 million, more or less. And then the first visible life, uh, when you see the trilobites and the fossils, that's about 540 million years. Wow. So that's the famous Cambrian explosion of life. Even in Grand Canyon, where it's thought to be one of the best and most spectacular records of geology, when there's a lot of <laughs> missing time. There's more time missing than captured in stone. Ah. So it's an imperfect recorder. So then based on that, is the great unconformity and the record of the evolution of life on Earth also present in New Mexico? To, to understand the entire history, we have to piece together what's been found in one area from another. The layer of limestone that you see when you go to the top of the Sandias, mm -hmm. that's present about halfway down as a layer in the Grand Canyon. Mm. And the oldest rocks in the bottom of the Grand Canyon are about the same age as the oldest rocks, 1.7, 1.8 billion, as the oldest rocks up by uh, in the Taos Ski area, for instance. Explain to me, what is the Rio Grande Rift and how is that formed? Sure, you could think of it uh, as a tale of two rivers, the Colorado mm. River and the Rio Grande. There you go, I like two that. Different, uh, <laughs> two different rivers, uh, one with the, the Grand Canyon, and then we have the rift, or the, the valley. So what's the difference between the valley versus the Grand Canyon? The Colorado River carved through the landscape to form the erosional feature of the Grand Canyon. But the Rio Grande flows through the Rio Grande Rift, which is a structural valley of immense proportion, far superior, I think, to Grand Canyon <laughs> really? as a geologic feature. And I am surprised that Dr. Carl Carlstrom, <laughs> structural geologist, thinks that Grand Canyon is more spectacular than our own Rio Grande Rift. Oh, okay, I take your point, I take your point. <laughs> but, but the point is, one is an erosional feature, as you say, the Colorado River carved the Grand Canyon, whereas the Rio Grande Rift Valley, which is an immense, pull apart where the continent has been stretched. It's one of the two most famous continental rifts in the world. The East African Rift is the other one. And at about the same scale and is the Rio Grande Rift. Wow. It extends from El Paso to central Colorado. It's a big tear in the, in the North American plate. And it is immense, uh, but it's all filled with sand and gravel from the eroded Sandia. So to the flying. casual observer, yeah. it right. doesn't look there like an go. amazing canyon. Right. Yeah. I like to think of the, uh, the, the view looking from Albuquerque up to the Sandia Mountains, and you look up at the crest and you see that, that beautiful white layer of limestone that Carl yeah. was talking about, the Madera limestone. And if you envision that this has been dropped down structurally beneath the city of Albuquerque, if you were to put Mount Everest on the top of that same layer, the mountain wouldn't even stick out above the ground. Wow. So that that's is a great far, way to describe that's it. That's far more spectacular, really, than Grand Canyon, but the problem is it's not, not visual. To, it's you have exactly. to see into the earth. Well, now you got me going. So the rift, <laughs> the rift is, is like uh, 30 miles wide and, and six miles deep, something like that. And the Grand Canyon is uh, 10 miles uh, wide and a mile deep. So as a, just a hole in the ground, if you took away all the sand and gravel from beneath Albuquerque, it's true. It's true, it's, okay. It's many, just kind of many scales bigger. use your mind's eye to see those scales. What is common ground in terms of your research for both the Grand Canyon and the Rio Grande Rift? We tended to be doing a lot of work along fault structures. 
And along those faults are springs. And from the springs were waters that tended to be salty and they were just fizzing with CO2. So we started to think about the link of the fluids coming up along the fault and trying to understand the patterns of that, linking those deep fluids uh, to see how they mix in and potentially degrade water quality. Uh, many people in New Mexico have been to a spectacular place like Soda Dam up near Hamas Springs. Uh, that's an example of a fluid coming up on a fault. It's a hot spring and it actually pours into the river. So even the surface waters in the Southwest can be influenced by these deeper fluids. In the old days, people used to think the Rio Grande Rift was a giant sandbox and that the water filled the pores between sand grains all the way down this 10 kilometer deep sandbox. Well, now what we've learned is these faults partition the sandbox into sub-basins. The movement of fluids up the faults changes the water quality, and only parts of the aquifer are really good uh, sources of groundwater. But one of the terms that we haven't actually mentioned is the term of tectonics or plate tectonics. Plate tectonics. Where's the nearest plate boundary? Well, the base of the plate is only about 100 kilometers beneath us. And it has, there's tremendously interesting things happening as uh, heat and mass gets transferred across Still. this boundary. Oh, yes, very active. And then we're sitting Always. on top of it, yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah. And in fact, that's, uh, that's, I think, a big finding of our uh, recent research is the hypothesis that in New Mexico, as well as Arizona, the mantle, the flowing, hot, convecting mantle, is uplifting the surface of the earth. So we can link this idea mm -hmm. of tectonism to things that are very important to us sure. in our daily life. Every time we turn on the tap and get a glass of water in Albuquerque, it's either surface water or the deep groundwater, and both are influenced by tectonism, whether we realize it or not. So then, what do you think another 100 million years is going to, what's the Earth going to look like then? The Atlantic Ocean is pretty much less than 200 million years old. So if you ask what might a place look like, imagine mm -hmm. when North America was much closer to Europe, mm -hmm. and it's only taken a couple hundred million years to rift apart. And so in New Mexico, where we're next to the Rio Grande Rift, there's a question, is the rift really going to expand? Will we sometime, at some point separate the nation in a way that has never happened in history? Um, most people don't think so, but it's possible. It's a, ma it's a major rift. In 100 million years, we'd have, we could potentially have an ocean here that's half as wide as the Atlantic. It's important to study the geologic past because the future is so yeah. data poor. Each, each seems like each rock has its own story, you know. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. Really appreciate it. Yes, you're quite welcome. So we're talking about traditional medicine without borders, and joining me is Dr. Cheo Torres, the Vice President of Student Affairs for the University of New Mexico, as well as Tonita Gonzalez, a traditional healer in curandera. Thank you for joining me. What is curanderismo? Well, curanderismo comes from the word curar, which means to heal. It's the art of Mexican folk healing or traditional healing and it's a holistic approach to medicine or to healing, dealing with the body, mind, and spirit. I think even though a lot of this medicine started traditionally as something common, you know, whether it's the Mayan or the Aztec or the Chinese medicine, they all had the same basis and foundation, but now science has been able to prove the validity of that medicine. There's a revival of sorts going on right now in traditional medicine at a time, oddly enough, when we have so many medical breakthroughs in science. People are longing for something else. I think for me, traditionally, one of the things that I tell the people that I work with, curanderismo for me is, it's a lifestyle. It's not just a medicine. It's a way to balance body, mind, and spirit. And unfortunately, I think allopathic medicine has tends to look at the body, not the mind and the spirit and the emotions. And most of the people that I work with actually had a patient that I worked with last week. And one of the things that she said, and you think about how profound, she's like, of all the doctors I've gone to, I never left with hope. It sounds like you give these people tools, too, to take charge of their own health to some degree. Sure. Absolutely. It's totally about enabling them, and not only enabling them, but really putting their health and happiness and their, is their responsibility. 
It's not that you're going to go to a magic doctor or a magic healer that's going to do something magical. It's like you making that responsibility to strive for your own needs and say what it is that you need to be balanced. I've been teaching a class at the University of New Mexico for the last 12 years on traditional medicine. In fact, it is called Medicine Without Borders of the Southwest in Mexico. And 12 years ago, I started with about 30, 40 students. Now we have over 200 students coming from all over the country, as far away as New York. So the word has uh, spread. Yes, they're looking for a course or something that will enhance what they may be doing, or they just want to know what grandma used to do, right. or, or, or their aunt. And, it's, and the students that take the class, they, they, many of them say that it changes their lives. Is grandma's traditional medicine contrary then to modern medicine? It sounds like there's probably a lot of synergies there. Well, it complements. Mm -hmm. We'd like to say that it can be integrated. Sure. And I think we bring validity to grandma's remedies and we study grandma's remedies and we tell the students why it works and what chemicals the different plants contain and why massage therapy is good for them and why pampering, in Spanish they call it apapachar, is good for them. <laughs> and, and, and also why chicken soup is healthy. All these things that we take for granted, we talk about. And we talk about modern medicine also and how it can complement one another. And Tonita, you had a first-hand experience of this, which is actually why you've been propelled into this field. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's actually a beautiful story. Well, there, one of the great parts of the class is that the curanderos that come up do different health fairs in the community. So years ago, I was sitting in the audience, and at that time, to know a little bit about my medical history, it's like, one thing, I did everything society wanted me to do. I have my degrees, I go to college. Right after I graduated out of college, I got sick. And I, I remember my grandfather telling me, he's like, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And I thought, you know, he's crazy. I've got this great scholarship, so I go and get my degrees. And then I realized, you know, this many years later, he was absolutely correct. And when I was welcomed and asked, and we did this kind of laugh therapy, and it began first when my grandfather passed away, I got Bell's palsy. So I was completely paralyzed. Then I got trigeminal neuralgia, which if you imagine, it's like the worst uh, cramp on your head. Then I got rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and it was just one thing after. There was a good two years, I don't think I left my bedroom. And it just took me on this downward spiral, and I really was looking for every allopathic doctor. And a lot of them would say, don't do massage, don't do this, don't do that, don't do herbs. And I listened because I had that science mind. But intuitively, I knew what my grandma, my grandma would say, you know, put ruda or ru inside here, and I wasn't doing any of it. And then a few years back, when I met Rita and she, you know, did this laughing exercise, and I wouldn't laugh. I mean, for me to be on the cameras today is huge because I was probably went 10 years without taking a picture, or I would talk and I'd put my hand in front of my face, and it was emotional scarring. And so when she took me on stage and she's like, "You're going to do this laugh exercise with me," and I was like, "Yeah, not so much." <laughs> And she pulled it out of me and she says, you know, you're not laughing because of your face. You're not laughing because of the pain in your soul. And at that point, it was like a huge light bulb went off. And I said, she's absolutely right. And I began to cry. They did an acupuncture treatment on me that day in the afternoon. And she did a treatment, it's called ventosas or cupping, because my face had become so hard, it was like rocks. Mm. So when she did this fire cupping, it was very painful, I cried. It pulled the blood in circulation because Chinese medicine and Mayan medicine, which I understand even more now that I've studied it, made that blood circulate to those areas and I, my face was starting to move. Wow. So it was a huge catharsis, but I really had to heal the emotional side. It's like I today take no medications. I've lost over 100 pounds. Wow. I know that healing is a process, but I also know that it isn't about what society claims as far as like what's going to make you happy my health and happiness is my decision and i have to do what fills my soul and i really feel in all that i have done this is the work of where i'm happiest i'm happiest when i'm sitting just like this with my patients and really be able to give them that hope and tell them that there's alternatives and if we start first with their diet and we start first about what they're consuming when they're watching television their lifestyle it all makes a huge difference. And they're not being just symptomatic or treating a symptom, no. but really, again, finding out what the root cause of something is so they can actually be proactive Absolutely. about it. Absolutely. We do sobadas, which is hands-on healing, somewhat like a massage, a little bit more intuitive. And Rita, my teacher from Mexico, who I adore, one of the things she says is anybody can receive a treatment and feel good. But to really heal, it's doing the deep emotional work. It's really healing and letting go 
then when somebody starts doing that, then they start transforming. One of the things that I was really healing for me is the Temascal. And um, it's a, what we consider is to be the womb of Mother Earth. And I've actually built one here in Albuquerque. But we do a lot of things inside, a lot of different body treatments. We can clean our lymphatic system. It's a we sweat can, bath, It's a right? sweat it's bath. It's very hot. Uh -huh, it is, but it's a little bit more different. It's a little bit more modern. But we also can do special treatments, and we use medicinal plants inside, so it promotes a different type of healing. Getting rid of the toxins in the body mm -hmm. and the mind. And more than that, though, is that it's dark. It allows people to almost be you could say reborn because then they can the cry womb. because it ha people have difficulty just like you and I talking to cry and release emotions and say I'm mad but when they're in there and they're dark and they're able to scream and let it out then becomes the healing and transformation. Is this scientific or is it quackery? It is scientific. There is some quackery like in any other air, uh, business and, mm -hmm. and treatments and healings but for example the plants uh, the plants have been studied. We know what chemicals they contain. We know that they affect your body if you drink them or if you apply them to the skin. We know the laugh therapy changes hormones and it's healthy for you. We know that massage therapy is healthy for you. It produces endorphins. There are studies now that have proven what our grandmothers and great grandmothers were doing wasn't off base. They weren't crazy. It works. Um, Those old remedies. That yes, and, and what's nice about people like Tonita and other uh, New Mexican healers is that they're, they're being trained. Tonita spent a year in Mexico, lived in Mexico City, one of the best curanderas in the area. She studied at an institute in Cuernavaca where they work with curanderas from throughout Mexico, Central America, and Latin America with quality control. What they do should be studied and should work. But they're able to, to use both allopathic and traditional medicine. Tell me why you think it's important to maintain traditional medicine. In New Mexico, we're known for our diversity and we're known for our traditions. And I think it's important for, for us to understand our traditions and the usage of, of plants and traditional medicine in our history. And of course, modern medicine is wonderful. Allopathic medicine, if I'm really sick, I rush to the, I'm, I have insurance. Right. But not everyone has insurance. But there, for, for minor illnesses, there's a way to deal with traditional medicine. We don't have to run to a physician for a headache or- An antibiotic uh, to take uh, care of An antibiotic, of course. Right. I mean, sometimes we can empower ourselves to take care of our body. You want to be healthy. And if you do get sick, you. It'd be nice to understand when you have to see a physician and when you can take care of yourself or your family. I think that's where it comes under the area of spirituality because when I say spiritual, one of the biggest problems, whether it's here or the patients that I have in Mexico, is that if you become detached with who you are, we say, quien soy, who am I? Because when you know and you're grounded with who you are, then you make better decisions. So when we think about it, this medicine is part of us, whether it's Chimayo and people doing blessings, or, you know, we, I had never known until I started doing this medicine. My dad mentioned to me, he's like, every meal my grandfather would get a little plate, somewhat, you know, like the Native Americans, and he'd bury under the earth to give thanks. I just want to thank both of you so much for being here. This is great information. Thanks for sharing it. Thank you. Sun is, of course, the life giver. We are here because we happen to be in the right spot with respect to the sun, which makes life possible. The real reason for solar flares is what is happening inside the sun. Sunspots are the seat of strong magnetic field. They sometimes get stressed. And when they get stressed, the overlying burden is then ejected as CME, coronal mass ejections. When they hit the Earth's magnetosphere, the magnetic shield in front of Earth, they create great geomagnetic storm. Thank you.
One of the most hazardous effect is that when solar flare happens, it produces lot of energetic particles in space. And therefore, there can be blackouts of the communication systems. Your computers start behaving crazy and it is hazardous to systems in space. Helioseismology will help us look into those patterns inside the sun and hopefully we will understand better why sun behaves like it behaves. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Do you have a question for our experts? Please email us your viewer questions and comments to askconnect at knme.org. Production support provided by the University of New Mexico.